Hi guys, this is Shannon from Reptile Way and welcome back to our channel. I'm so excited to bring you this new build video, but before I chatter away, let's actually show you what we're going to be building. So I hope you enjoyed those little highlights of the build we're going to be doing today. And we're actually going to be getting Gimli, our bearded dragon that's just behind me to help us out with this video. But let's dive straight into this build. This is the plan that I drew up for this particular build. So you can see on the left hand side we've got the entire build with the dimensions and then on the right it's broken down into each panel with the measurements. But you can take into Bunnings this particular sheet, screenshot it, print it off and this shows you each of the products with the exact cuts you need to make. Now some of these do have quite a bit of off cuts. Now you can change the design to make sure you don't have as many off cuts or you can save those off cuts and use it for future build. But it's done in millimeters because that's what the cutting machine is at Bunnings. But these are the exact products on their website too, just so there's no confusion. And at Bunnings, it is really good to go there and use their cutting machine because if you're like me who lives in a small place and you don't have the room for a workshop and all the particular machinery you need to cut this wood, this is a great option and all you need is a drill for this build. And this is all the wood and how it fits in my car. That back panel just fit in my car. Um, but now we're stacking each of these panels up and we're going to see to make sure if the measurements are actually correct. And yep, they're correct, done perfectly, nice and flush, which is what we want. So now we can actually start measuring where we want to drill our holes through. And I'm just using a carpenter's square. And again, you can buy these from Bunnings. Now, how I'm actually doing this is I'm using one side of the ruler to sort of measure the distance between the holes, which is 60 mils. This is a bit overkill. You can probably do 80 to 100 mils. And then we're doing 8.5 mils in from the edge. And this little device here is just to sort of tap little indents in and this, this just stops your drill from sort of slipping off. And I've wiped up all those areas to make sure it's nice and clean. When I put the silicone on, I'm using Gorilla Tape to help almost like clamp it because I don't have the clamps to be able to clamp this wood in position. Um, so I'm just gonna use Gorilla Tape. I've got endless amounts of that. And once I've sort of Gorilla taped it in place. You can um, pop a screw in the top and a bottom to properly secure it and put that pressure in sort of straight away before that silicone dries. But this is the drill I'm using and you can get it from Bunnings, super cheap. We're drilling some pilot holes in first and this is just gonna make sure the screws are gonna go in nice and easy. Now these were the screws that I had at home. So you probably want screws that are about 38 to 40 millimeters in length and that's just gonna make sure it's gonna go into both bits of wood but it's gonna go in far enough that it's going to provide the strength that you need. And it's also handy to sort of hand screw the screw in a little bit and then drill it in. Um, yeah, it just makes you sort of make sure that screw is going in nice and straight. But there you go, all the screws are in and we've secured the side walls to the bottom panel. And now what we're going to do, we're going to flip this over because I want to put the back panel on now, that large piece. Now this was definitely too awkward for me to lift the back panel myself. Um, so I did require a little bit of help, but before I do anything, I'm actually marking out where the drill holes are going to be, where the screws are going to go in, and uh, before I do any drilling. 
and that's my neighbour. I traded some banana bread for his assistance to help me lift this piece on. I've run a bead of silicone around everywhere I need to for this to get stuck and make contact with the other pieces. And yeah, nice and easy when you've got somebody helping you. So this was the only section I needed some assistance from somebody else. And now we are gorilla taping this in place again, just for that pressure. And also I did pop a screw in each of the corners just to apply even more pressure um, whilst that silicone is still setting. But now we want to screw in all of the screws um, for, to secure that back panel and these screws are going to sort of sink into the piece. So they'll eventually be covered with wood putty, sanded down and painted. Now this is the back panel, you don't actually have to go to all this hard work like sort of sinking them in and wood putty sanding but I actually wanted to practice this technique and practice with the wood putty and all that so that's why I did it but you don't have to. Now I'm actually running a bead of silicone around because we're about to put the lid on. So this is when I started to get a bit excited because I was like, oh, nearly done. This build is actually getting there. It's working. All the measurements, you know, uh, are coming together. And again, using the Gorilla Tape because I have endless amounts. <laughs> And we're just screwing in that top piece and these again we're going to sink the screws in and I'll show you a little bit later the method of how I sink the screws in. Um, Now we are about to put the wheels on. Now I wanted to make sure these wheels can hold a lot of weight. So each wheel can hold about 70 kilos, which is great because these builds do tend to be on the heavier side. We're using those screws to secure the wheels. And we're marking out where we want the wheels to go. I'm popping some silicone on, and again, it's just that aquarium grade silicone I've been using throughout the build. I've got some Gorilla Tape on the wheels to secure that wheel in place, as it does take a little bit of time for that silicone to dry. And now we're drilling the pilot holes. Be careful, you don't want to go all the way through. You just need it deep enough to get that screw in. Now with these wheels you want to make sure you've screwed these wheels on nice and tight so I'm just double checking to make sure that screw is in nice and tight because you don't want it popping off especially if there is a bit of weight behind this build. And there you go, it's that easy to pop some wheels on. So the outside four they actually have um, brakes on. The two middle ones don't. And then later on I decided to pop another wheel right in the middle. And this will just prevent that wood from sagging, especially when you're gonna put about between 40 to 60 kilos of sand in. This is the wood putty I'm using to fill in all the areas of where I've sort of sunk the screws in. And to be honest, I did use a bit too much wood putty. Um, on this back panel. So keep that in mind, you don't need to use as much wood putty as what I've used. And what's great guys is this is such a good learning experience. But anyway, look, I'm so happy <laughs> so far. But now we are getting on to putting the tracks in for the sliding doors. So these are just uh, wardrobe tracks from Buddings now. They only have it in a white color from what I'm aware of. And I was a bit gutted. I thought oh, I'd like it in a black color, but to be honest, the white does look quite nice. Now before I properly secure anything in place, I've just gorilla taped it, clamped it in place, so temporarily put things in place so I can test to make sure these doors I got from Bunnings actually fit. Now I've left the protective film on for the moment, so they are completely clear, but this protective film just stops them from getting scratched. But it fits, it's all good to go. We can start screwing everything in place, which is exciting. <laughs> so we're gonna start off by securing that top lip in place. 
and again I'm using that aquarium grade silicone because I did find in prior builds because this sort of wooden material we're using to build the enclosure has a very shiny smooth surface uh, wood glue just doesn't really like it at all so I found the aquarium grade silicone works the best also it's reptile safe and so that's why I've personally used it but write in the comments if you found another glue that works really well um, let everyone know but now we've already secured the substrate lip in place we're now popping that wardrobe track in place now for those sliding doors and we're just wiping up any silicone that's there I'm also putting a nice bead right at the end this is just going to cushion the doors from smacking into the edge and also it's gonna really secure that track even more. You can pop um, a nail in there from a nail gun, but you don't really need it. Now this is how I embed the screws. So you saw I used a smaller drill bit and now I'm using a bigger drill bit to drill a bit of a bigger hole, but not as deep. And then that allows the screw to sort of sink in. And you can hide the screws with wood putty, sand it and paint it, and you never know the screws there. But that's the top lip is totally secure. You also see there's a wood panel that's like in the middle. I've just put that there to stop the lid of the enclosure from sagging when I'm doing all this stuff. So that's another good technique. But now I need to drill and properly secure that top lip. So I've sort of put nails, all oh, screws, sorry, throughout that whole top lip. But now I'm flipping it over because I need to do the same with that substrate lip. So the bottom one, and again, make sure you're measuring out all your holes so you know it's gonna go straight into that uh, substrate lip, that bit of wood. Now with the amount of screws I'm using, it's probably a little bit overkill, so again, you don't have to use that many. Um, you'll see towards the end, I did run out of screws, so I missed a section. But here we go. The structure is looking absolutely great. I'm so excited with how it's turning out. And now we can get started on the interior. So now what I'm doing is I'm running a bead of that aquarium grade silicone again, reptile safe, throughout every single seam inside the enclosure. Now, yes, it can act as a waterproofing, but one of the main reasons I'm doing this is because when you actually spray the spray foam in there, and when you get to that stage, it can get through the tiniest of cracks. So it can get through and then expand onto the outside of your enclosure and cause an absolute mess. Now I'm actually putting the ramps in place and I've got that heat lamp there to sort of see how high I want these ramps to go, the position of them. Now I am aware that you can't get these foam sheets from Bunnings anymore, but I'll chat a little bit more about that later. And I'm just removing these foam sheets, marking it, and then I'm actually gonna silicone them in place. But if you can't find these foam sheets from Bunnings, um, for some reason I don't know why they've stopped stocking them, but you can go to Officeworks, you can look online for them, you can use packing foam, you can even use the foam boxes that your food orders come in as well, there's so many things. But now we've got those foam sheets in place, we're going to get onto the spray foaming. This is the vast amount of spray foam that was used in this build, so you can simplify the build so you're not going to use as much spray foam, totally up to you. But now I want to create channels that's going to guide this spray foam, because what spray foam likes to do is it just likes to spread outwards and not necessarily, uh, you can't really build it upwards without it sort of spreading outwards as well, if that makes any sense. So what I'm doing is I'm using some packing foam to create those channels, and that's where I'm gonna spray a lot of the spray foam in, so it's gonna build upwards.
And now we're gonna be spray foaming the rest of the back wall. So where I'm spray foaming now, this is towards the top of the enclosure. And again, you don't have to, you can just have the ramps or you can just do the back wall. You don't have to do side walls as well. I'm doing a lot of this for aesthetics. So if you're on a bit more of a money constraint, it's okay, you can still make a really cool build. But before I actually flipped this up to spray foam these sections, you have to make sure the spray foam has expanded and it's not still soft because if it's still expanding, still a bit damp, and you lift it up, all the spray foam's just gonna fall off. So keep that in mind. The spray foaming can take a few days because you're waiting for it to expand and set before you do any more. So now I'm actually breaking off some of the packing foam because I'm gonna use some of this um, sort of foam sheets that I'm breaking off now uh, later for the side walls. And this is a really good bit of advice. Um, say foam that you carve off too, spray foam. You'll see me using it a little bit later on to put rocks and boulders on the side walls. And I even use some of the spray foam to put um, boulders on parts of the ramp as well. And you can save it for future builds as well. So you can really do these things and have as little wastage as you can. Um, but now I'm just sort of, Instead of using spending a lot of money on spray foam to do the side walls, I'm just using this foam that a friend gave me from when she was moving house and she bought a whole bunch of new stuff. And I'm using that for my side walls and I'm using the last can of spray foam I have just to spray foam in any little gaps. And that's all the spray foam pretty much done. It's expanded. And now it's time for the fun stuff, carving. I'm pretty sure I spent 12 hours carving. It was like a whole day. <laughs> so this can be a very time consuming process and also your vision is gonna change. So you can see where I've had that big clump of spray foam now. I thought, oh, I can make a nice rock or boulder. It wasn't practical for me because that's actually how Gimli was gonna enter onto the ramp. So you can see me removing that and I was sort of a bit, you know, annoyed that I used spray foam in that section, but I kept the spray foam that I carved off to use, like I said before, on the side walls, on the ramp. So again, at the end of the day, you don't really have to waste anything, but you really wanna make sure you carve, carve off that entire top shiny coat of the spray foam. Because if you were just to grout straight onto that spray foam without carving, it doesn't adhere to it, that, the grout. It's sort of too slick a surface, so it can flake off. But now you can see I'm digging almost like a hole. So this is gonna be the entry um, from that bottom ramp onto the top ramp. So I'm creating a nice sizable hole that has a ramp going through the hole that Gimli is gonna be able to get up there nice and easily. And that hole's big enough that, you know, she's gonna wanna enter and go up the ramp. But now I'm working on the vent panels. And again, I'm just doing a nice, easy technique for vent panels. We're just gonna drill some holes in. If I was to improve this design, I probably would have made the vent panels a bit bigger and more holes drilled in. But again, this is still fine for this size enclosure. Um, but just keep that in mind. It's always good to figure out ways of how you can improve your builds. And the reason why I'm sort of doing this is because I wanted the vent panels to disappear into the build. I don't like them being obvious and wrecking the aesthetics. So that's why as well I decided to go along with this. But we're just using that aquarium grade silicone again to stick some of these boulders on, which is the spray foam that I carved off. And um, so again, we're recycling. Also, it looked too neat. So again, you want things to look natural. So that's why I actually am picking off those sides so it's not gonna look too blocky and square and man-made. 
And this is the basic carving done. So this is the basic carving before I've put the boulders on, extra boulders on the ramp or the side walls. So this is what the basic bones of the build looks like. And then you can add um, rocks, boulders onto certain sections of the ramp where you maybe want there to be more surface area. You can add rocks onto the side walls. You can keep the side walls nice and smooth. It's totally up to you how you want this build to go. But now we are drilling in the holes for our vent panels here. And you can't really tell, but these are quite sizable holes. It's funny, this enclosure makes everything look quite small, but these holes are a decent size. And it's gonna be quite messy, so you're gonna vacuum it up. And this is how you can sort of make it nice and smooth on the outside, you can sand it down, but to stop the wood from splitting on the outside as much, you can clamp a bit of wood to the back of the enclosure, and then when you're gonna drill through, the wood's not gonna splinter. Just a bit of a tip that I thought of afterwards. But here we go, now we're going in with the first layer of grout. So we're using the Davco Sanitized Black Grout, Black's a really good colour to go in for um, your first layer because when you get later on in the stages and you start carving the grout, you know if you hit black, oh, let's stop, we're about to hit foam. Um, but this first layer of grout, I always recommend you wanna go with a very thick pancake consistency. Especially with spray foam, you wanna fill in all those air holes, um, get into every nook and cranny you can. Now, yes, this may take away a little bit of the detailing that you've carved into the spray foam. So when you're carving into the spray foam, really um, accentuate areas because again, thick layers of grout and multiple layers of grout will sort of, I guess, hide the details, but you can carve into the grout later on to sort of pick up those details again. But yep, start off with a thick, pancake consistency first and then as you go through the second, third, fourth, I think I used four layers over the entire thing and then six layers of grout on the bits like the ramp that Gimli is going to be using. There's going to be a lot of uh, commotion going on on those sections so I want it to stand up to wear and tear. But yeah, as you progress through those layers to the fourth, fifth, sixth layer of grout, um, the the grout gets a lot thinner, more watery. So the first few layers of grout, once you've done that, you're gonna see cracks, that's okay. Because when you do the next layer, the next layer, the next layer, it'll be thinner and thinner, fill in those cracks and eventually there'll be no cracks in this piece. So that's just how I go about. Now uh, you would have seen me put a mirror there because doing underneath this bottom ramp, I couldn't see. So I'm using the Davco white sanitized grout for the rest of the build. And yeah, it was really hard. Had to do some contortionist work there, but the mirror's really good to see where your eyes can't see. But now we're putting some of that Davco white sanitized grout for the last couple of layers, but we're gonna make it earthy red color. So we're gonna add some of this brick red in. We're gonna mix it up so it's all in there. You can start to see the color. And because I want it to look more natural, I'm gonna put this chestnut brown in. And again, it's gonna make it look like an earthy, sunburnt red, which is what Australia is known for, especially I used to work where these guys are originally found in Central Australia. And it's a beautiful part of Australia with beautiful colors. A lot of painters drew their inspiration from Australia, that sunburnt look. But now we are doing the last couple layers of grout and this layer of grout is obviously this nice colour but each layer of grout after this, the next one, I'm doing a slightly different sort of red tone. So throw some different reddish brown tones in there in your last couple of layers and on different sections. But there's the grouting pretty much complete. Now we're going to get into... Um, sort of making sure your vent panels aren't blocked up by the grout because I did sort of go over the vent panels and grout. So you can just use a screw to make sure they are completely clear and it's gonna allow air to pass through. And now we're tidying up the top. 
of this enclosure and again this is just for aesthetics so gonna give it a clean nice finish And now we're actually carving into the grout. So you wanna make sure the grout is pretty much dry, but it's sort of damp to the touch, and that's the best time for carving in your cracks and grooves. I did add a few extra little bits of different colored reddish brownish grout, just again, so it's not gonna look so uniform over the top but it's looking quite nice. But now it's time for the spray painting. So we're gonna be using just some acrylic paint in some water, and you can go for any sort of brown color, I guess. And you're gonna to wanna to make sure as well, you shake it up well before you use it, and then you spray it on somewhere else so you know the consistency, the color's right, and you want this to spray out like a fine mist. And again, you don't have to go crazy and spray it absolutely everywhere. You can just spray it in certain areas where you want that color variation. And yeah, it's starting to look a bit more natural. And this is just a cheek technique, especially if you don't have all the spray painting kits and things like that, that may be a little bit pricey. And now we're gonna do a bit of a darker brown. So I'm just adding some black into that spray bottle there. And I'm spraying areas where I think are gonna be darker. If you're looking at this from a natural sort of cave perspective. Also, I want it to be able to trick your eyes. So we're gonna play with depth a little bit here. And I'm really darkening the areas that go further back into the piece to make it look like it's going even further back. You're going into a deep, dark cave and it goes back further than what you think. So this just helps trick, trick the eyes a little bit. And yeah, just gives it that depth to make it a little bit more realistic. And now we're going in with the last bit of painting. You wanna make sure that spray painting is completely dry before you do this one. We're just using a simple white acrylic paint and we're actually gonna dry brush it on. So this means that you're gonna wipe most of the paint off your brush and then you can brush your brush onto the piece and some of the white will come off onto the piece and it's gonna give it like a worn effect, like the wind and rain have been sort of wear and tearing at this piece for thousands of years. It's going to make it look a little bit more old, more naturalistic, more real. Um, you can add different colours like um, yellows and greens for bits of moss, up to you. But now we're going in with the waterproofing. And with this waterproofing, make sure you follow the instructions. And you can see that I'm starting up at the top and I work my way down with the waterproofing. And that's because the waterproofing runs down. So it sort of makes sense to do it like that. Now over the entire piece, I've used about four coats of waterproofing. But then when it comes to the ramps and the flat areas where Gimli can poo, I'm using about six to seven layers of waterproofing, just to help with wear and tear. But at the end of each layer of waterproofing, wipe up the bottom. Again, it's just gonna give you a nicer finish. Use a rag, old towel, old t-shirts, old clothes, up to you. And now we've waterproofed the entire inside, so now we're gonna address the outside of the enclosure. So we're sanding down all that wood putty to, that we've used to cover those screws. And once you've completely sanded that down, make sure you wipe it down, clean up all the dust, um, and then you can get going with the painting. So we're just using a simple black paint for this design. I wanna keep the enclosure black. And again, my painting technique is not the best. <laughs> so I'm sorry if somebody does this for a natural profession, you've probably got lots of little tips and tricks. Feel free, write your tips and tricks 
in um, the comments if you've got any good links um, that show you how to paint furniture properly, the good techniques. But now we've painted the outside. I think I did about two, three coats of that black paint. Now I'm sanding off the wood panels at the front there because I'm actually gonna stain it a really nice brown. Um, so this was a bit of a change in the design. I was just gonna have it all black, but then I was like, oh, I wonder what it'll look like if it's got some nice wood at the front that's been stained. So yeah, we decided to go with that. So this is the product that I'm using. And again, um, first time I've ever really stained wood. So don't judge me on my technique. <laughs> and you would have seen I did put sticky tape on the tracks where I don't want this wood staining to get. So that's a good little thing to do. Uh, once you finish the staining, you're going to take that sticky tape off the tracks and you're going to touch up any little bits that you've missed. And then it's good to wipe up any bits off the tracks pretty much straight away with a soapy cloth and then a dry cloth afterwards. But there you go, it's starting to look really, really good. Quite nice and professional if I must say so. But now we're going in with a gloss. And you can do about two to three coats of this, follow the instructions on the tin. And this is just gonna protect your painting, protect your staining, and yeah, it's gonna make it look nice and glossy and have a really professional finish. And we're also putting that on the wood panels as well. And this worked really nicely on the stained wood. Um, I wasn't sure how it would look because I've never used it on stained wood before, but it seemed to work pretty well. And this is the lighting that we're going to be using for this enclosure. Now you don't have to use the same lighting, but I'm using Arcadia for the UVB. And then I've got some of those cages for the heat lamps. But again, I'm going to explain how I'm going to set up the heating and lighting according to my climate towards the end of the video. But anyway, we're putting some dots as to where we're going to drill the holes to thread the cords through. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm starting off with a thinner drill bit to do the first lot of holes. And we're drilling obviously from the inside out to start off with. And then I'm getting a bigger drill bit to drill from the outside inwards. And this drill bit is the size of the cord. So it will be big enough to thread the cords through of those heat lamps. And this again is just gonna protect the outside of the enclosure. That's why I did it that way so it's not gonna stuff up the paintwork. Now we're gonna dismantle these heat lamps, taking the heat bulb out, we're gonna unscrew this to expose the cords. Now before you get all excited, mark with a pen where that red cord is gonna go. Um, so when you're gonna screw the cords back in, you know exactly, screw those wires back in, you know exactly where the red and the blue one goes. So once you've threaded the sort of cord through that hole you're going to thread the whole heat cage back together so when you're dismantling this heat cage remember how you dismantled it it just makes it a bit easier later on and it is a little bit fiddly to sort of screw this all back together so have a bit of patience and now we're getting the cage and we're going to screw this back in around the cage And we'll pop in that heat bulb in, closing up the cage. 
and we're gonna gorilla tape this to the roof of the enclosure so it's in place we're gonna drill our pilot holes and then we're gonna drill our screws into it and there you go it's just that easy to put these lights in and they all work which is great and now I'm using the template for the UVB light I did the same method with the wardrobe build where I marked exactly where the holes are on my little template um, but do it whichever way is going to be easiest for you so I've drilled the pilot holes now I'm screwing in these clips that the light is actually going to clip into now you can pretty much just hand screw these in um, as they screw in quite nicely but you can use the drill to tighten it up a bit but you can see how hard it is to clip in. I bloody hate clipping those lights in. I'm scared I'm gonna break it every time. But now we're popping the bulb in. And if you've never put one of these bulbs in, there's YouTube videos on how to put it in. We're threading the cord through that the light connects to through a hole I drilled, but now we're popping the cage on, securing that cage with Gorilla Tape. We're drilling the pilot holes. We're gonna pop the screws in, and again, you can pretty much hand screw these in, but it's always good to tighten it up with the drill. And there you go. All of our lights are done. Now you've probably got a lot of debris in your enclosure now from doing all that drilling. So you're gonna vacuum it up, wipe it all up so it's nice and fresh. We're popping the doors in, it's getting exciting. It's nearly finished wiping up all the marks on the doors. And now we're gonna set up our enclosure, it's nice and clean. So I've put some sticky tape on the track there and stop that sand from going in. This sand is just from Bunnings. It's 20 kilos a bag and it's sanitized play sand, safe for reptiles. It's quite popular for people to use for reptiles in Australia. And I think I used about two and a half bags of this sand, so about 50 kilos of sand. So you can see why I chose the building materials, especially like the wheels. It's got to be strong with the weight this uh, particular piece has. But we've popped a log in there. We're also using this fake plant that I got from Spotlight. I've just sort of cut bits of it off and I'm using that to give it like a eucalyptus -y feel, a dry open woodland. But here we go, we've got Gimli and she's gonna be testing out her new enclosure. And this just makes it all worth it when you get to the stage. Uh, I was a little bit nervous to see whether she would be able to go up these ramps, but we'll see how she does. Now you can see the hole here that leads from that bottom ramp up to the top ramp. This was what I was nervous about. Is she gonna go through that hole? And you can fit about three to four Gimli's through this hole. It looks deceptively small on camera. But um, I was like, is she gonna use it? And she did it straight away. This is her first time going up that ramp. So Gimli, absolute trooper. She did really well with this design. Now these are obviously the lights, I'm going to go over that again towards the end of the video because I've changed the bulbs that I've got in there after doing some testing, heat testing over the week or so. Just to let you know, Gimli did actually pick the moment of her moving into her new enclosure to shed. So all of the amazing footage we've taken was through her shed cycle. So <laughs> if she's looking not too great, not too crash hot, a little bit flaky, that's why. She's totally fine and healthy. It's literally she just picked the worst moment to shed. Now before we end this video, we're just gonna quickly go over the important factor of getting your lighting, heating, temperature right in your enclosure. 
Now this is really important because how I've set up my heating, lighting and the bulbs I've used, it may not work for the climatic conditions you are in, but we're gonna go over how we tested this enclosure temperature wise over the span of about a week and um, how you can test your enclosure's temperatures before you move your bearded dragon or whatever other reptile you decide to put in there. Now after a week of testing, I came to the conclusion that Gimli's enclosure needs to have a 50 watt heat bulb there on the right and then not so strong UVB bulbs replacing those other two heat bulbs in the cages. And then there's that long UVB light in that cage. And the reason why I came to this conclusion after temperature testing, I have a risk of overheating my animal. I'm in a warm part of Australia, so that's why I've set it up that way. Now, how Gimli's heating sort of works in the entire enclosure, it's not based around a hot right-hand side and a cool left-hand side. It's based around a hot upper half and a cool lower half of the enclosure. And this style is quite nice because the upper half of the enclosure heat rises, so that works great. And then also it mimics what she'd be doing out in the wild. To get warmer, she's gonna climb up higher, bask in the sun and to get cooler she's going to go hide in cracks crevices in the shade so it works quite nicely this design now when it came to the temperature testing how i went about it first of all i'm using a temperature gun that i bought online you can get lots of these online you can even get a temperature gun from bunnings totally up to you where you buy it from just check out the reviews just to make sure it's a decent one and i'm going to be temperature testing all along the areas where Gimli is going to be going to adjust her temperature. So we're getting temperature readings along both the ramps, down on the ground towards the front of the enclosure, down at the ground towards the back of the enclosure. So we're getting a good temperature gradient of the entire enclosure. Now a great way to do this, you're going to get a bit of scrap paper, you're going to jot down the date, time and all of your temperature readings. Another good thing to do is in each of your temperature entries have a note section where you can jot down the room temperature, what bulbs you have in the enclosure that are on at the time and this is going to allow you to realise whether I've got that bulb and it's making it too hot, do I need to change some bulbs around? So making all of those notes will help you out a lot. Now the times I personally recorded the temperatures were at 6am, 9am, 12pm, 4pm, 8pm and 11pm. Now especially if you're in a cold climate, taking that temperature before the lights are turned on at 6am and quite a few hours after the lights have been switched off at 11pm is really important because it's going to determine whether you're actually going to need to have a bulb on at night, a heat bulb, and you can get ones that are suitable for to have on at night that emit very little light that sort of mimic moonlight so it's not going to disrupt the sleep cycle of your animal. Um, so they're really important temperatures to also take. And again, this is just going to ensure your animal is going to stay nice and healthy and the temperatures are going to be correct. Now, one thing that did make me extremely happy after I did this build and when I did all the temperatures, just check out that temperature gradient. That is perfect for a bearded dragon, which is awesome. And it's going to allow Gimli to thermoregulate and live a happy, healthy life. So thank you so much guys for watching this video. A big thank you to Gimli over there behind me. She's done such a great job and you know, she's been awesome in this enclosure. But if you did like the video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up, hit subscribe to be made aware of future content. And until then, we'll see you next time. Bye guys.